Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 120, Seneca is providing us with a number of very helpful clarifications about how the Stoics understood virtue and indeed the highest good, which can be understood as living virtuously or the virtues or as happiness, freedom, all these things that we put together, smooth flow of life. But another way of talking about it is as the good or the honorable in Latin honestum. And we're going to come to that in just a moment. Part of what's going on here is he's bringing together a number of different important Stoic doctrines about not just virtues or the good, but how we human beings come to recognize it. And so I think this is a particularly useful and important letter because it, it connects so many different threads together. So he begins by talking about the good in Latin, bonum, right? In Greek, agathon and the honorable honestum in Latin, the word that we get honesty from, and you know, it, that kind of falls into it, but it's not just about truth telling. It's about what is intrinsically valuable. Honestum is a translation of what the Greek philosophers called the, the kalon, which is a, a term that could be used for the beautiful or the fine or the noble, the honorable. What it is that we, we see as good in a robust sense, something that has intrinsic value and that we recognize as such. Now, the Stoics held that the good and the honorable are actually the same. So we're going to talk about what he has to say in a moment. One thing I do want to point out is the Stoics viewed them, according to Seneca, as distinguishable. distinguishable. We can actually talk about them as different modalities. So they are diversa in Latin, but they're not different. They're not separated from each other. They don't have an existence on their own where something would be good but not honorable or honorable but, but not good. They're not divisa in Latin. And he's going to contrast this to other philosophical views and indeed the common sense views of many human beings where they do make other things good. They will call them goods and the Stoics would say, well, you can call them good, but they're not really good. So you're misusing that term. Here's, here's what he uh, gives as an example. The good for some people is just what is useful, utile in Latin, and thus they apply the term to wealth, to a horse, to a wine, to a shoe. You know, and, and these things are useful, right? I mean, wearing shoes is nice. You can get around. You don't stub your toes. Uh, the gravel doesn't hurt your feet, right? In the case of myself, who has to wear orthotics, it helps me not feel bad in my body to wear shoes. Wine can be useful for all sorts of things, from getting drunk and having fun to a marinade to, you know, uh, making a sacrifice. We could, we could go on and on. Wealth, useful for all sorts of things. And he says, so little do they value the good, and so far does it descend among menial things. The honorable, they think, is what accords with the reasoning of a fully appropriate action, such as caring devotedly for an elderly father, assisting a poverty-stricken friend, campaigning bravely, delivering a sensible and well-balanced policy statement. And by appropriate action, that's, that's uh, a one way of translating the Latin word, officium, which we also translate as duty. 
So it's not that these people don't recognize that there is the honorable and that, you know, could be about fulfilling duties or engaging in fully appropriate actions, doing good things that are actually intrinsically good. But then they add other things in there as being good. And so he talks about utility. We might also talk about pleasure. If we're thinking about the Aristotelians, the Aristotelians actually said, following Aristotle, that there are a number of different kinds of goodness. There's the kalon, the, the good that's you know beautiful. There's the... Uh, the useful, right? There's also the pleasurable, there's the just, all of these are different modalities and they may overlap to some degree. The Stoics say, no, 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 that's not the case. Only the good is honorable, only the honorable is good. That's one of their slogans, you could say. So he says, uh, nothing is good unless it's honorable. What is honorable is necessarily good. I judge it to be superfluous for me to add what is the difference between these because I've mentioned it frequently so you can read through his other letters. The point is, I will state here is that nothing is good that can be used badly or wrongly or to do, do injustice. He says, you see how many people make bad use of wealth, social rank, physical strength. We could talk about wine. We could talk about sexuality. We could talk about automobiles. Any, any sort of thing can be misused if it's not a genuine good, but can you misuse virtue? Now, you know, much later on, Immanuel Kant, in his groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, will seem to be going a stoic path, but then say, well, you can also use what, you know, we could call the virtues wrongly. So the bandit who is courageous, right? Uh, the person who has great mental powers can use them wrongly. The Stoics would say, you're wrong, Kant. If it's genuine courage, it's not going to be used wrongly. If it's genuine wisdom or prudence, it's not going to be used wrongly. So there's an important distinction there. Then he talks about something else that the Stoics had a very interesting position on. And he, he goes into some useful discussion, particularly when we correlate this with other Stoic discussions like that, for example, put in Cato's mouth by Cicero in On the Ends, book three, where a similar thing is being said. Here's the question. How did we get our conception of the good or the honorable? Does it just arise out of the fact that we have certain inclinations, for instance, to maintain ourselves in existence or to create new versions of our, our species and then to take care of them or to associate with each other into groups and, and you know, live out a certain common life? Uh, the Stoics said, no, not exactly. This is not coming directly from nature although it's not against nature and actually on a higher level fulfills the potentialities of our nature. We human beings are capable of a certain ascension, let's call it, or if you like an old fashioned term, a quantum leap from one level of valuing and choosing and appropriating up to a higher one that's incommensurable with it. So he tells us that nature itself did not teach us this conception of the good or the honorable. It's not that nature doesn't teach us what's good for ourselves in, in another sense, in like being useful, maintaining our existence, or pleasurable. But the good in this sense is not something that nature itself could teach us because nature doesn't provide us with knowledge of that sort. As he says, it just gives us the seeds of knowledge. So this is a nice metaphor for Nature, it's not totally disconnected from this, but this goes beyond nature. And he tells us that um, some people say we merely happened upon the conception, but it's beyond belief that anyone would have stumbled across a notion of virtue by chance. And here, you know, this is worth actually reflecting on. How the hell would you know what it is if you don't have any clue about what virtue is? How would you, how would you recognize it in all of these myriad things in our experience. Seneca puts forward a different theory of a different kind of process. So he says that we arrive at it by observation and comparison of actions. 
Now, notice again, what is he saying there and what is he not saying there? We don't just like look within ourselves and detach ourselves from the world and then reason about, you know, what we're encountering in the, the space within. No, we're actually looking at other people, some of whom may be people we know and some of whom may just be people that we've heard of. And we say, wow, what is that? What is going on there? This is really something awesome. And then we start comparing them. And we're like, well, that, that person did something quite good by comparison to the rest of us rumdums who are, you know, just kind of getting by. And we're going to look at a few examples that he provides in just a moment. So he says that um, in the judgment of our school, they're understood by analogy. And he says, this term analogy came to us from the Greeks. It's been naturalized by Latin scholars, so I think we should use it. I will use it not only as legitimate, but fully established. Let me explain what analogy is. And here he gives you an, an example of an analogy, maybe an analogy of an analogy, if you want to get a little meta uh, in, at this point. He says, we knew about bodily health. From this, we figured out there also exists a health of the mind. So we've got several terms there, right? Health, body, mind, and then we say, okay, what is the analog? What is the thing that would have the same sort of function or role or whatever, whatever meaning we're attributing to it in the mind as it would be in the body? And we, could, we might do this in reverse and say, what are the things that go wrong with the body? And he actually gives you a whole list a little bit later in the uh, letter of things that go wrong with our bodies. And then we can say, well, what are the things like that that go wrong with the mind? And what makes them bad for the mind? Well, the things that are bad for the body are the things that impede our natural functions, right? Or go too far, don't go far enough, right? So things like that with the mind. Now, he doesn't spell that out for us here, but we can easily fill that in. He says, certain acts of generosity or humanity or courage had amazed us. They struck us. And we were like, wow, what, what is going on there? And so that's, that's part of how we draw these conclusions. And he says, we began to admire them as though they were perfect. But there were, in fact, many flaws in them, hidden by the brilliant appearance of some splendid deed. These we overlooked. Nature tells us to magnify praiseworthy actions, and everyone carries glorification beyond the facts. This was, thus it was from these acts that we derived the notion of a mighty good. So there's a, there's a sort of fictitiousness here, isn't there, that Seneca is acknowledging. We actually go beyond, when we're looking at these, these virtuous people, we go beyond the, the actual case, and that allows us to grasp a possibility for us that isn't actually being realized in these people that we're dazzled by, but does become a possibility for us if we build upon it. And so let's look at some of these examples now. He brings up Fabricus. Fabricus was one of the people who is involved uh, against King Pyrrhus, who you probably haven't heard of, other than the notion of Pyrrhic victory, which you can look up. Pyrrhus of, of Epirus was one of the rivals of the Romans and the Carthaginians and some of the other Greeks in the time when Rome was on the rise. And there was a good possibility that Pyrrhus could have established his own empire and, and dynasty. And history would have been quite different. He was an outstanding individual. And one of the people who was involved with Pyrrhus, um, his doctor, offered Fabricus, this Roman, uh, the chance to use the doctor to betray him, to betray Pyrrhus. He offered to poison him. What did Fabricus do? Instead of saying, yeah, that sounds good, all's fair in love and war, right? He turns the information over to Pyrrhus and says, listen, I'm going to fight against you, buddy, but I just want to give you a heads up. This doctor of yours is trying to kill you. And he reached out to me and said, would you like me to... Uh, to help you out with this sort of thing. Now, that is uh, an act of virtue. We, uh, so he says, both actions show the same strength of character, not to be won over by gold, not to win by poison. We admired a great man, one who is swayed neither by the offers of the king 
nor by offers made against the king, a man who struck, who stuck by his own good example and did what is hardest of all in that he maintained his integrity even in war, believing that even an enemy can be wrong. So he gave us an example of what, what human potential looks like when it's realized. Does that mean that Fabricus was perfect in every way? No, no, no. It doesn't mean that at all, according to Seneca. But we look at that, that particular example. He gives you know, several others as well. Um, Hortius Cocles blocking a narrow bridge against the enemies of Rome uh, all by himself, showing you know, incredible bravery. And he says, these and similar deeds gave us a picture of virtue. And so no, now notice this. It's not by simply generalizing about virtue. Seneca thinks that, at least at the starting points, we actually need what we can call role models. We need examples of people who stand above and do things that are human and show us the potentiality of humanity that goes beyond our own medi- you know, mediocre or milk toast uh, lack of virtue and charts out a possible path for us. So they're still flawed, of course, but that, that's not that uh, essential here. He also then tells us, okay, we do also carry out a sort of analysis of virtue. We divided this virtue into parts. The Stoics recognized four cardinal virtues, wisdom or prudence, justice, temperance or or moderation or self-control, and courage or bravery. Each of these encompassed subordinate virtues, which you can read about in Arius Didymus or, you know, in other places in the Stoics as well. And so what is, what differentiates this? Why have more than one virtue? Well, he tells us it was right that desires should be curbed. Temperance. Fears checked. Courage. Actions performed intelligently. Wisdom. And each person rendered his due. Justice. So we grasped these different things and assigned to each its own proper function. So he says, from what then did we gain the understanding of virtue? That that person's orderliness revealed it to us, their seem, seemliness and consistency, the harmony among all his actions, the greatness in surmounting everything. It was thus that we came to understand happiness, the life that flows smoothly and is completely under its control. And then he goes on a little bit further, and it's worth reflecting very briefly on this. He says, how then did this very point become evident to us? The the sort of unification of the virtues is a possibility. The perfect man, the one in possession of virtue, never cursed his luck, never reacted to circumstances with a grim face, believing himself to be a citizen and soldier of the world. He took on each labor as if it was a command. He treated no incident as an annoying nuisance and misfortune, but as a task assigned to himself. And here we have sort of the portrayal of the Stoic sage. Arguably, Socrates fits the bill for that, and there may be some other figures as well. Now, the the last important question that we want to think about that Seneca is providing us with some great answers to is why are some people not virtuous, including perhaps ourselves? Why, Why haven't we made this the centerpiece of our existence? And there's really two main things that he talks about here. One is... Uh, you know, sort of a a difficulty that arises because of virtue. Um, He says that uh, some virtues and vices border on one another. And in people who are depraved and dishonorable, there's some likeness to rectitude. So what are some examples of this? A spendthrift person gives the false impression of being generous, even though there's a huge difference between them. Spendthrift means somebody who's, we often say, prodigal. They spend everything. They're, you know, uh, careless with their money. That's not the same thing as being generous. He also says, um, carelessness can look like good nature, temerity like courage. And he says, this similarity compelled us to take thought and distinguish things that are close in appearance, but immensely different in fact. In observing those who'd become famous for doing an outstanding deed, we began to notice the sort of person who did something with nobility and great zeal, but once only, right? So we're seeing a person who can't, as we would say nowadays, transfer 
bravery from one area to another area, or temperance from one area to another area, or justice from one area to another area. So some people get mixed up about the virtues and vices, and they think that just because a person does a virtuous action once, they're virtuous, right? Or because they do a vicious action once, they're, they're you know, ir irremediably vicious. Um, so that, that's one big problem right there. The other thing that he brings up, and he's touched on this already a little bit, is, is a certain kind of instability. A virtuous person is consistent in virtue. So he goes on and he tells us that, uh, here we go, when we saw a person with this strength of character, how could we not get a notion of a remarkable disposition, especially if its consistency showed it to be genuine greatness? Truth is stable and consistent False things do not last. So there's, there's a bit of time required to determine whether somebody really is virtuous. Now here's where it gets really interesting. He says that some people are uh, vatanitas and Cato by turn. Sometimes they find curious, insufficiently austere, fabricus not poor enough, and to barrow lacking frugality and modest living. Other times they compete with Lachinus in wealth, Apicius in gourmet dining, and Mekinus in refinement. So what they, you know, he's bringing up a lot of people who you may not actually know, but he, suffice it to say, some of these are examples of great virtue. Some of these are examples of great vice. And what he's saying is sometimes people think, hey, I'm going to be like, I'm not just going to like rival Socrates. Man, I'm going to be better than him. And they forget that it takes a long time to become a Socrates. You can't just turn it on or something like that, right? And then the next moment or the next hour or the next day, they're taking a cheat day and they're like stuffing their face like a Picius or they're, you know, doing all sorts of other things that they're not supposed to be doing that are, if they want to live a life that, that's virtuous. And so he talks about us as you know, he says the best evidence of a bad character is variability and constant shifting. Constant shifting between what? Pretense of virtues and love of vices. A person who doesn't have a fixed character, except in the sense that you can, you can count on them to pretend to have virtue every once in a while. To, to have virtue, to, to develop it, to follow it, that's a lifelong task. Seneca speaks in other places about virtue is something sort of like when you dye uh, fabric, you can't just dip it in once. You've got to be continually doing it until it sticks, till it holds fast. So there's a lot of people who fluctuate between you know, the vices that they're indulging and pretending or yearning for virtue. And the reason why they can yearn for virtue is there's still some recognition of its goodness. They're drawn to it. They're attracted to it. They just can't realize it in themselves because they're still giving priority to those vices. So if we want to become virtuous, we actually need to figure out, you know, who, who our role models are and how we want to be and do some thinking about this and probably some study. And then we have to make a decision to have our life be one of consistency.